Welcome to Rivcast, a civilization podcast focused on its console platforms. L Thrasher, Scotty X, CV. It's um. All right, all right, Emery. My son, sorry. And it's just a... I was the guy on the radio. Hello, everybody. This is Rivcast with your host, um, Scotty X here. And today we've got um, Jeff Ekenese, uh, Saboyola, or whichever name you prefer to use. This is CB, coming live. Live out of Texas. Live from Texas. <laughs> This Rivcast, we're going to cover a bit more of the sort of topics we were covering last time with some of the technical details that we've learnt through testing and things regarding how Civ works, how huts work, great people. Possibly we'll just um, quick have a talk about um, any um, tournaments and things that are going on at the moment. On the PS3 side, we're reorganizing an eight-man tournament because the last one got into the semifinals. And uh, unfortunately, one of the players dropped out. He just went MIA. I don't know what happened to him. And right now, there's a lot of action going on on the King titles. I got a, a whole lot of those King titles. I want to get all of them. <laughs> Good. Who's your competition over there for those King titles? Mostly Doja, Unbeaten Doja. He has a couple too. It used to be uh, Angelus, but he doesn't play Civ as much anymore, so he doesn't have his titles anymore. Uh, other than that, like, it's this new guy named Terminator. He's been playing for the titles, and a couple other guys play for the titles, but I'm trying to win them all. Yeah, okay, very good. Over on the Xbox side, we've got our World Championship starting up. Um, so we've got brackets one and two going. Other, other people can join up for the bracket three if they want. We're... Uh, now uh, that's uh, bracket two is the one that I'm in. How does the setup work on the on those brackets? How do you win it or whatever? How does it go? As I understand, if you win your bracket, you will go through into the um, final round. So um, my bracket, we're fairly, we're doing quite small brackets. So it's me and Liam Suddy and Glenn Iyer and it's denied. We'll play out that bracket and the um, and the winner will go through into the finals. So in the bracket play, you have to play within the same tier or how does it work? We're all playing within the same tier, one of one of each of the civs against the other guys. So I've got three people that I've got to play. And so in the top tier, I've got US, China, and Zulu. So I play US against one of them, China against another one, and Zulu against the remaining person. And then all the other people do the same thing. Keeps the games within the tiers, and it works out quite well mathematically. So it seems to be quite a good design. So it's five tiers. So you have to play everybody with every tier, and then that's the end of the bracket, or you play five games versus the person, and that's the end of the bracket. How does it work? Five games against each opponent, so 15 civs used total. One gets dumped, and that'll be um, the extra one in the f- tier with four civs in it. I see. I see. I think we need to mention that the tier play, Scotty, mm. it, he invented that, just to let you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he introduced that with... Uh, a knockout tournament on the PS3 side and it's kind of stuck. It was really a good idea because yeah. in the tournaments, if you were known as the best player and a person could use any C if they want against you, most of the time you got the better players getting... You got the Zulu or whatever, yeah. <laughs> so with the tier play, I feel like it's much more competitive. I think that was a good idea. Also note that I'm the current Apex King, so that's good. Ah, uh, yeah, on the Xbox side, the Apex King, yep. that's like the... Uh... One of the top titles anyway. Not quite world champion, but it's still pretty good. So let the listeners know, how do you become the Apex King? On the Xbox side, you acquire one of the King titles by beating a previous King. Probably it'll be like top tier or something. You need to beat the other guy with America, China and Zulu against his America, China, Zulu. And then if you win King title like that, you can then challenge the Apex King. So you risk your King title. And if you win, you can catch his Apex title. If you lose, you lose your King title. Ah, so you have to put your King title on the line to challenge the Apex yep. King. That's, that's pretty yep. nice. So that prevents you from just challenging, challenging, challenging. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Recorded for episode 44.
Okay, I have a question here, and this is something all of our listeners will want to know the answer to. How do I get barbarians to give me 50 gold? All right. A few years ago in a tournament game, it was a semi-final thing, and I was playing Arabs versus Spain, which isn't the best matchup yeah. in the world, but it felt like I had some hope in that game. Yeah. And my first three barbs each gave me 50 gold, so I destroyed him. I got to him so quickly with so much material that he was yeah. just dead, which is a great way to beat Spain, by the way. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that other than that one game. So what happened? How did that happen? Well, in terms of the 30, 40, 50 switch, which is the various gold ones, I mean, in Game of the Week, we'll flick through those based on, you know, attacking a barb and getting one injury or attacking the barb or doing something else before you attack the barb. And it appears to go like, if you get to the very tiniest aspect of a tweak, it goes 50, 40, 30, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's nearly my experience. Yep. But the problem with that, of course, is that as in a multiplayer, you're never going to know exactly where that's lying. In your game, where you've got three fifties in a row, it just happens in between each of your huts. It looks like there were just enough tweaks to flick it back to a 50 again. You were pretty lucky there. Couldn't it also be related to what other people were doing with barbs at the yeah. same time? Or yeah. well? Your warrior attacks the barb, and he gets uh-huh. injured two times, and then he kills the barb. And then he heals back up, and then he attacks it again. That's going to give you a different result from if he attacks, he gets injured once, and then he has another go. That means that maybe since the Arabs attack barbs better than other sieves, that it could they would be more, more likely to get 50? Well, it could give a more predictable result. If for your first barb, it would probably make a difference, but I'm not sure whether it's going to give you 50 or, or 40 or 30. Thrasher, do you remember if you had to heal in between taking those barbarians, or were you able to just go boom, 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 one to the next? No, to the- I, I don't remember for sure, but I doubt I had to heal. I mean, the Arabs usually don't. You're attacking 2 to, to 0.5. Right. So, And they can take a wound and keep fighting. Probably not enough data for us to be able to uh-huh. say much uh-huh. um, conclusively, because there'll be a bit of space in between each hut that you took. And we can't tell what actually happened in, the, in that space of time. But the game uh-huh. knows what happened. And it knows everything sure. that everybody was doing. And it's taken into account each of those little tweaks that have happened in order to come up with your result of 50-50-50. Most uh-huh. results probably 50, 40, 30, you know. Is it uh-huh. related to, to something like, for instance, this game, you know, I had two barbarian huts. One was being attacked by a unit with blitz. One wasn't. So obviously the one attack, I'd actually already killed one barbarian unit in there, but it, you know, it took two attacks for the regular legion to finish the job. Uh, it could be related to that sort of thing too, you know what I mean? If you could do your barb killing in turn and you had like some blitz units and that sort of thing, you could, you could see something which you could make sense of with a pattern, possibly, if you're like really paying attention. But between turns, it's just going to be too much that's going to change. Yeah, there's not really much of a strategy mm. there. All right. Okay. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but the thing that you can do, which is the um, one where you, where you meet the where you meet the AI to um, flick your gold over to caravans, right? So you guys mm-hmm. just would rush out and you'd go find an AI and you go, okay, and then you kill the barb and the computer goes, oh, okay, so he knows an AI now he's got somebody to send the caravan and you get a caravan, send it off. I to see. Them. Does that mean if you don't meet anyone, you can't get a caravan? Well, I wouldn't guarantee that because Unlikely. there may be something that I'm that I'm missing there. But it is a switch for getting a caravan. Okay. Yeah. I can remember uh, one time playing as the Mongols, mm. getting a caravan out of a, out of my first friendly. Friendly, yeah. I wasn't settled yet though. Just walking, it just popped me a caravan. Oh, you got the caravan unsettled. Unsettled. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I seem like I've gotten it from meeting barbarians. It almost seems like that's considered the same as meeting an AI. With the friendlies, it's, um, yeah. I mean, that is the place you could set the caravan if you wanted to. Just don't get any gold. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. In some ways, you'll find the barbarian huts work the opposite way. But the spies, for example, when you've got a spy, you know you hit the friendly hut and you're quite likely to get another spy. But when you've got a spy and you hit the barbarian hut, you won't get another spy. I found out something interesting, which I didn't quite realize. You can still get a caravan from the barbarian hut when you have the caravan from currency out on the board. Ah. Huh. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, I used uh, one of my huts this week. I, I decided I wanted to spend money on settlers rather than waiting on a 250G. So I started using a hut for currency instead and found that out. Mm. Oh, and I also found out at one point, I started to mention it on the forum, but I didn't bother. Did you guys know that barbarians can attack you through a friendly hut without disrupting that hut? (laughs) I think I did know that, yeah. 
Mm. Good dimension. It was a choke point that happened to have a friendly hut. I had a unit camped out there for Christ, probably 800 years, 1,000 years. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and I forgot about it. At one point, finally, barbarian units from the nearest barb hut, which was about, uh, say, four to five southwest of the friendly hut, made their way up and attacked me through the friendly. And I actually had to pop the friendly hut to go back and attack them with like a warrior. The galley one is probably one of the big ones, isn't it? That you're yeah, you yeah. your barb and you want a galley. This one isn't, doesn't seem completely clear, but it appears that there's one hut on the map at any particular moment in time that will give you the galley. And that hut is in a particular location, um, like the closest to Wonder or something like that. If you popped another hut, so, so let's say it was set to a hut that was in a certain location, maybe the one that's closest to Anchor or Kawad or something, maybe. I'm not 100% sure about that. Let's say you pop that hut, but at, this, at that particular moment you had a galley out on the, on the field. Now it'll default back to your um, caravan on the spy galley caravan switch and horse. And that will make someone else, some other barb give It'll a make galley. some other barb available for that galley, yeah. That could be related to Scotty's proximity, like he was saying, to the artifact, because I've had it happen, you know, two different locations, two different artifacts in each, you know, direct. Yeah. Uh-huh. Does this mean that if I get a galley, there's probably an artifact nearby for me to get? We think so, although I'm not 100% sure about that, because it, it may be triggered by being close to where an artifact might have been on that map, or something like that, because I have had a few scenarios that didn't seem to I mean, side some, that theory. So, sometimes you get the galley, and it shows you an artifact, and sometimes mm. you get the galley, and it doesn't. So mm. <laughs> seemed like it was for use on the AI cap, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. You'll pop the barbarian hut that suspiciously gives you a galley that leads you yeah. right to Rome, you know? Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I've had a lot of games where I get the galley and it gives yeah. me it. It may well be that uh, yeah, an AI cap also functions the same. As it, so it's like the closest hut to either an AI cap or a wonder or something like that. Or the, or the closest to a potential starting location gets the galley. But the, the test obviously was we, we went and popped some huts and we found the one which gave us a galley and it tended to be close to a, to an artifact. And then when we cancelled that galley by having another galley out, popping it, and getting just gold or something, then disbanding the other galley. Then when we popped another hut, we could get it, the galley from the other hut. I see. So on the switch, like I was saying, we've got horses, caravans, um, spies, and galleys. Then you've got 25 gold, like, for example, when you've got a, at the beginning of the game where no other options are relevant. You've got a caravan, but you've already got one out on the field, other than the currency one, obviously. Oh, hey, Scotty, what about that? Uh, didn't we decide at one point that you did need X amount of gold to get alleys that if you had, if you were below a certain limit? Yeah, that was one of the tests that I did, that when I had hardly any gold, I was popping the cut for the galley and wasn't getting one at the beginning of the turn, obviously. I'm not 100% sure on that because we didn't verify it as much as I would have liked. But yeah, I was, uh, and there was certainly a game in there where I was popping them and I could mm-hmm. control it by setting my gold to below 10 gold or so. And it just wouldn't work at all. Something similar, and, and it was you know controllable enough that I did kind of test it, and it was something like uh, if I had 18 gold, I couldn't get it. If I was over 20, I could, you know. Yeah. I've definitely gotten galleys when I had zero gold. I mean, out, out of my first one, so... But did you rush the unit another. and then take it? Or you, you just hammered the unit no, and then took it? it. Mm. Yeah. Actually, no, I think I had a theory there. My theory was that the AI had to have more gold than you, or more, or a certain amount more gold than you. So, so that's why his number might not have been exactly the same okay. as mine in terms yeah. of gold. So yeah. at the start yeah. of the game, no problem getting a galley because um, nobody has any gold, generally speaking. Later on, more of a problem if, because somebody will have some gold. I wonder if an Aztec AI would thwart your galley strategy. <laughs> I'm thinking it might. What about the AI popping a barb hut and getting a galley? Because they do that sometimes. How yeah. do you think that's our ability to get a galley? You think it might cancel it? Like, a, I'm pretty sure that you can get a caravan while the other guy has a caravan out. So I'm thinking maybe it won't affect it. You see the AI wandering around of the caravan. You pop a hut for a caravan and you get one. So it doesn't seem like that cancels. So I'm thinking maybe the galleys won't cancel either. They'll only look for your galleys. Okay. It's hard to make much use of, of the barb one because, uh-huh. um, I mean, I, I mean, aside from we already know about meeting the AI in order to send caravans there, but in terms of between it, how to get a galley, it looks like it's going to be quite hard to use. I've, it's not that it's random, it's just you don't know. Mm-hmm. I pretty much I was just taking barbs when I saw them. If it's to the point to where I need a galley for an AI or something, I mean, I'll just find the way to get the money and rush it. It's, it's a lot easier than trying to work out barb hut seat.
lot of people have realized for a while that when you hit your barbarian huts, you, you get various rewards, you know, your gold and your caravans. And sometimes you get tech and sometimes you get horses and um, all of these sort of things. Sometimes you get spies. Sometimes you really need 50 gold from a hut or you really want a caravan. Getting a caravan gets you maybe 70 or 60 gold or so in the end in relation to popping it into an AI. So it's quite useful to know what you're likely to get as, as a result of popping the barbarians. If you're playing a game of the week, your people will have realized that when you meet the AI, that'll tend to give you a um, caravan. So we'd play and we'd wander, you ended up to meet an AI, say hello to them or whatever, take the barb, then you get a caravan. And before that, you're probably getting gold. If you have met the AI after you hit your hut, your chances of getting a caravan go up significantly. Mostly all the time. I wouldn't say 100% because, you know, not 100%, but a lot of the time you're going to get a caravan. If you move your unit away from the AI again, you can make it cease to be a caravan. And if you move it back towards them, you can make it a caravan again. So there's a thing about the distance that you are from the AI. Obviously, when you meet them at the beginning and you notice you're starting to get caravans, you're right next to the AI, right? But if your units have got a big distance from them, like um, we were testing like four squares from a city or so, you can switch it back to being uh, to exposing one of the other rules. So you're talking gold and spies and that sort of thing. So um, maybe you've got a caravan that's in completely the, I mean, the, the use of it, I guess, is you've got a place where you really don't want to get a caravan is completely the wrong position. You're going to have to disband them anyway, and you're only going to get 30 gold. And you've got some unit up relatively close to, to the AI. And so you get rid of that unit or move them away from the AI, pop the hut, and then get your uh, gold, let's say, or 50 gold or 40 gold or something. Um, so if you needed yeah. that gold, gold more, you know, watch your proximity, watch your distance that you have to the AI. So what, what was like around the distance that you needed to be away, though, that you can recall? I think if you're within four squares of the city, I think that there may be a difference in between straight and diagonal, so diagonal being one and a half and straight being one. So I think if you're five squares away, so five you know, across the one and a half diagonals and one going across, so you could be two diagonal and two across or something, then you're outside of the range. But if you're closer than that, then you'll be within the range. I see. I see. Not 100% sure of the exact number there, but... It, Somewhere around there, which is why... Usually when we meet the AI really early, we're within that radius. So when we hit our barb, it's going to be a caravan. Yep, exactly. So there's that. The other thing that we've got is if you've been getting caravans, you've got 2,100 and it flicks over to the year 2,000. The likelihood is that caravan is going to be a horse. What would have been a caravan 2,100 will be a horse in 2,000. That may make you um, particularly want to pop that hut much earlier in most situations because a horse is probably not all that useful to you unless you've got two horses in the region and you're popping the hut straight after that and you're planning forming a horse army, in which case it probably is quite useful. Right, right. So players out there could use that to their advantage. That was what was happening in my testing anyway. There may be some other reasons, some other things that might go to horses, for example, but it does look like it's um, 2,000 caravans of horses. What year does it happen that your 1 to 0.5 is no longer safe? Like if you're attacking a bar 1 to 0.5 with your warrior or your archer and you lose, what year does that, that stop? I think that's on the year 2000 as well. So 2000 is like a, it's a big year. It's a special year for new stuff to happen, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think there may be other steps in that process where you still have a certain guarantee at 2,000. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe maybe it's four to one or something you've got to guarantee. But then you get another year where like zero or so where that guarantee rolls off. Right, right. But that's why a lot of people have the misconception that archers attack worse than warriors. Because it (laughs) it would seem like, man, my archers always lose to warriors. But usually yeah. when, when you have an archer attacking a barb, it's usually it's going to be after 2000. Yeah. So that's why your archer was losing. It's not because it hit less. If you, if you have a uh, first barb hut gives you uh, bronze work, and instead of putting out a warrior, yeah. you could put out an archer. It's going to have the same chances of winning as that warrior because it's still going to be before yeah. 2000. The other thing that we particularly like is t- to get is galleys. And as far as I can tell, getting a galley is related to a specific hut on the map is allocated the status of getting a galley until that hut is popped. And that hut seems to be the closest hut to an artifact or something like that. 
sometimes it seems to there seem to be slightly um, confusing factors in here because sometimes you, you pop a hut that isn't that close to an artifact but most of the time it seems to be the one that's closest to an artifact there's some sort of factor related to that in it if you pop that hut got a galley and then disbanded it another hut would become the trigger for being able to turn into a galley but if you didn't pop that hut then popping the other hut that will switch to becoming a galley won't give you a galley until the first one's triggered and, and i did that in testing quite a bit of testing on that so that seems pretty robust isn't there a seed that gives you galley spy what's that seed the trick with the galley that we're talking about there is that remember if you have a galley out that means you can't get a galley from the hut so the hut that would have given you a galley when you have a galley out will instead give you probably uh say a spy but with a barbarian hut, it works different from the friendly huts. With a barbarian hut, if you've got a spy out, it won't give you a spy. So now if you've got a galley and a spy out, that same hut is probably going to give you, let's say, a horse, because let's say you're after, you're after 2000 BC. Or it might give you gold if that's the next option. Remembering also that we've got a, uh, we could have a caravan step in there, that it might give you a caravan. And if you've already got a caravan out, a caravan that is, I think you might have discovered this, a caravan that has been um, discovered on a barbarian hut as opposed to one that you got from currency. If there's a caravan out, then it will force you to get the next lowest level, which is going to be your gold or your horse. Hmm. So basically, if I remember correctly, galley, spy, caravan, horse, or gold. But there's also yep. a seed. This is a let alone from the seed that I think if someone has writing and like every hut will be giving you a, a spy. Oh, okay. Yep. I've seen it before. Well, I've got like three spies though. Uh, oh, three spies from barbarian huts, is it? Yes. Like from hut, every hut just kept giving me a spy. Thank you, friendly. So with, with the friendly huts, it's the opposite formula to the um, barbarian one, in that getting a spy means you're more likely to get a spy, maybe even guaranteed in, in some situations. So I've got a spy out, I pop the friendly hut, second spy, another friendly hut, another spy. If I disbanded that spy, I'd make it more likely for me not to get the spy. There may also, as you were hinting here, there may also be a rising rule as well. Yes, I think it really did have something to do with that. When China was on the board, my friendlies just constantly were giving me advice. You mentioned about how engineering your great people. Oh, yeah. You did testing and you can get it down to the actual name of the person. I heard a couple of people mention on the forums that wasn't really useful in a lot of games. Mm. To some degree, that's true. If the game is uh, going a certain way, you might not be allowed to do that. But it can be very useful. It's very useful not especially if you have the great person after I'm working. Let's say, for instance, you're playing with the um, English. You're going to get your great person earlier than normal. So you might can make it where that's your highest technology is iron working. Yep. And I mean, that great person to get Sam's castle early is just it's hard to lose with that. Gives you that, that extra power. The testing that Scotty did, they had it down to where they knew the name of the great person that was going to come up due to tech you had. The easy one to do is to know when you have horseback riding, it'll tend to give you Thomas Beckett. You start off as the French or someone like that. You sit around and do nothing except for tech horseback riding, and you find that you'll get Thomas Beckett maybe nine times out of ten, something like that. Yes, and you know, it's not 100%. Because yep. it's other things that come into play when they have this formula. We might not know the exact formula, but it's not actually so, your highest so, tech. So each tech that you research unlocks other techs further up the tree. So it gives you access to ones further up the tree. Horseback riding, for example, gives you access to feudalism. And ironworking gives you access to metallurgy and steam power. The amount of beakers that it takes to tech those techs amount to the number of tickets, if you like, or balls that are being added to the lotto of what GP you can get. Each of those balls, if you like, is associated with the GP of that tech. So for horseback riding, is associated with Thomas Beckett. In the meantime, you're going to also obviously have horseback riding because you've ticked it, and you'll have access to pottery, alphabet, and bronze working. But feudalism is far more expensive than any of those other techs. So the weighting is very much in favour of feudalism. And that means that, I, that I'll be able to say, hey, I reckon you're going to get Thomas Beckett. You're probably not going to get Aesop or one of the other ones for the other techs. But ironworking is particularly good because you'll know that the arrows for, on the tech tree go very far up the tech tree to reach steam power and metallurgy. So you know that those are very valuable techs. 
and the weighting for steam power and metallurgy are going to be far greater than the weighting for the things associated with bronze working or the things associated with maybe pottery, let's say, if you've got that. Does monarchy come into play when you have the English though? Well, monarchy is going to open up religion, so um, you're opening up an artist there. But religion is still further down the tree than steam power and metallurgy. So the GB and GS of those two are going to still outweigh the GA from uh, monarchy. If you were to um, not take anything else, then you'll have good chances of a GA there. This isn't entirely the full story, because in testing, me and Hello Goodbye found out that you could get very high rates of certain GP that even defied that statistic, as long as you played in exactly a certain way. And so what that seems to imply, and I did quite a bit of testing around this as well, is, is it seems that each of those tickets are added to the pool of options you can get in a certain order. If I tick ironworking, let's say, it looks like it adds the GP in alphabetical order of the GP, and then the seeds flick through it. If I pop at GP straight after I pop the tech, then I'm going to have, I think, because this is really hard to test, but slightly better chance of getting the GP that's alphabetically the first in those two. The, the games that I played lately, that makes a lot of sense because I've been getting iron working right around the time when I get the turn before I get my great person, and it's been yep. that same great builder a lot. You know, not every time, but yep. a whole lot. Yep. Your GB is winning out over the GS, not just because they're the high expensive techs, but also because he's the first one added. There's a second factor in here, which is also pretty useful. The system actually goes and checks your tech tree, right? But if you haven't set your tech, then when it checks the tech tree, it doesn't detect you as having all the tech. So it goes up and it um, just adds together every tech, the probability of getting the tech from anywhere on the tech tree. And that means that it includes superconductor and um, globalization and all this sort of thing. So let's say you're playing um, France, let's say. You've got iron working, you've, you've started off attacking the sky. Maybe you, you, you thought that a GS would be quite good to start off with, but now you've realized that the guy has a massive pikeman army up in, up in a city that you're attacking. You really want a GA. Now you pop your last tech, whatever it might be, it might be pottery or something, and instead of um, selecting your tech, if you select your tech, you probably get the iron working associated GPs. But if you don't select your tech, you've got a pretty good chance of getting a GA. Maybe about, I don't know what the odds are in the end, maybe 29% or 30 or something percent. It's, but it's going to be a much better chance there of getting your GA than it would have been if you had selected ironworking. Then you'd have almost no chance of getting a GA because ironworking would completely override it. So by not selecting a tech, you can just switch your odds over. Now, if you have a spreadsheet, as long as you enter the techs that you've got and even better yet, the GP that you've seen in the game, so if you've seen Agamemnon in the game, you know that you're probably not going to get Agamemnon yourself. If you've seen um, you know, Marie Curie, you know that, uh, so for example, if they hit Invention um, first or something, or if they hit Marie Curie, let's say, you'll know that you're probably not going to get it yourself. You're probably going to get the um, builder. If they've got the builder, you know you'll probably get the scientist with ironworking, that is, or invention. So if you keep a list of the one GP that you've seen and the tech that you've got, you can create this little probability thing which says I've got an X percent chance of getting this GP. The, the alphabetical thing is going to be a little bit more difficult to keep track of. But again, um, once you know your tech, you'll have a good feel for who that might be, which one comes first alphabetically. If it really doesn't look good for the thing that you want, then just flick your um, tech to um, to not ticking anything when you tick your last tech, and there you go. You've, you've got a pretty good chance of a GA. Or if you've already got the GA that's on the on the high tech, then you'll be able to figure out that you're probably going to get whatever the next one is. I know some people shoo shoo it. It won't apply that well to multiplayer, but uh, there are certain situations where it could win you the game versus a good player. might be about, about it. Yeah, I think pretty much covered what we can cover in a single session here. So um, that was us. This is Scotty X. This is and Scotty. signing thing. For more information about Revcast, Sibling Shows Polycast, and Modcast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. Record date. December 28th, 2012. Civilization Revolution Sound Clips. Copyright Take Two Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.